your camera. If that doesn't bother you, then um, feel free to join us and show your face and be part of the group. So just to introduce our presenter today, um, Marilyn Bresto has been a director of Refugee and Immigration Services for more than 30 years. Um, she's the granddaughter of immigrants who escaped persecution in Russia, and she believes diversity makes us stronger. Marilyn serves on the board at Reestablish Richmond and does what she can to bolster the welcome. So we're very lucky to have her here today, and um, I'm very excited to learn from her expertise in this area. So feel free to take it away whenever you'd like, Marilyn. Okay, well, thank you very much, and thanks for joining. Um, so I got involved in refugee resettlement uh, professionally in 1978. And um, uh, refugee resettlement really got going in Richmond in 1975. Uh, and I'll go into that. But uh, uh, as, as we all know, refugee resettlement happens locally here uh, in our community. But it starts overseas and it involves um, many players and, and policies. So I will go through a, a brief history. Um, here, I, 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 I take pains to let you know that I'm imprecise. But um, uh, in 1920, the League of Nations, um, after World War I, recognized the the need to protect refugees. Uh, they, they put forth a definition of, as a, uh, that this is a person escaping persecution outside their borders. Um, but um, coming out of World War I, the United States was isolationist. Um, we were dealing with the, the 1918 pandemic and we of course did not sign on but there was a uh, hope for world peace and um, the League of Nations was supposed to help uh, nations solve their differences peacefully, but we failed and the world returned to war. So after the horrors of World War II, the United Nations uh, issued a universal declaration of human rights uh, stating that everybody has the right to uh, seek asylum from persecution in other countries. This was clarified uh, in 1951 um, in, the, in, the, in the Convention on the Status of Refugees. What was said there was that a refugee could not be expelled from the country uh, that they seek asylum to. Uh, they should not be punished for illegal entry. Uh, refugees would have the right to work, the right to housing, education, public relief, freedom of religion, access to courts, freedom of movement, and uh, they would be guaranteed um, identity and travel documents. But the United States did not sign the 1951 convention. Uh, our country made its own laws and finally signed on when they were uh, um, strengthened in 1967 to extend to refugees uh, beyond Europe. And then the Refugee Act uh, that really codifies US law was signed in 1980. So what does that mean for Richmond? So the United States was not very generous in providing protection to those who were facing Nazi oppression in the 1930s. Uh, approximately 328 refugees arrived in Richmond um, before World War II. And in that time period, about 200,000 uh, immigrated to the US. After World War II, displaced people were grudgingly offered an opportunity to resettle. Uh, the little asterisk takes us to the fact that in 1945, a Gallup poll revealed that only 5% of Americans were willing to accept more Euro European immigrants 
than prior to the war. So even after hearing about the, uh, the gassing of 6 million and um, uh, the genocides uh, throughout Eastern Europe uh, and Europe, um, we still had a pretty closed door policy. Uh, 37,000 displaced persons were admitted between uh, December 45 and July 1948. Most of these were Jewish. And if it's proportionate to other numbers, maybe 66 came to Richmond. And uh, from 1948 to 1952, almost 400,000 displaced people were resettled. Um, but uh, the majority were Christian um, who had also suffered horrifically and maybe 500 came to Richmond. I don't have those numbers. Um, Marilyn, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, if you are sharing a presentation with us, we're not able to see it. Oh, you're kidding. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have said something sooner. Oh my goodness. How do, okay, let me escape and get. I am glad we, huh, there's, I don't have a, a share, I had shared it with Sharon beforehand, and I don't see how to get to share screen. At the bottom of your Zoom window is a green share screen. Hang on, maybe that's the problem. Let me get back to Zoom. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, we ran the test and it looked good and then you stopped sharing. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that the, that you had planned to start sharing from the start. Yeah, let me, um, cause I, I'm sorry folks. It's all right, we'll figure it out. I have to maximize my Zoom, and I don't know how. All right, I am very sorry. Well, you missed all my beautiful pictures. There you go. And now if you go to slideshow, we'll see it full screen. Okay, all right. So let me quickly show you my slides. I apologize. So uh, the League of Nations size and then um, the Holocaust. So yeah, you didn't get to see my cool pictures of Richmond. Um, well, I appreciate you interrupting <laughs> to, to tell me that. So in the 1950s, um, uh, the US primarily was uh, focused in off offering refuge to folks who were escaping communism. So in that time, the US admitted about um, 31,000 Hungarians and 500,000 Cubans because uh, we had much more regular interaction with Cuba. Uh, and uh, talking with a Cuban friend, uh, she asked around and figured there were about 14 families that came to Richmond in that time. Um, and of course, the parents of uh, Manny Menendez, who uh, came at that time. So uh, um, you, will, you probably know some Cubans that were part of that exodus. The 1953 Refugee Relief Act uh, uh, took pains to uh, differentiate between groups, calling refugees uh, somebody who came from a non-communist country is fleeing persecution. An escapee was somebody fleeing communism. And an expellee was an ethnic German who was forced out of Eastern Europe. So in that time period, uh, almost 200,000 refugees, escapees, and expellees were al allowed to resettle in the US before the legislation expired in 1956. Our involvement really uh, grew because of our overseas involvement in Southeast Asia in the 1970s. 
1975, uh, the communist Viet Cong entered Saigon and the United States helped some of those uh, with whom we had worked to flee for their lives. And this is a famous picture of people being um, transported out as the, the troops arrived. They were brought uh, to military bases across our country, in Pennsylvania, in uh, California, in Arkansas. And I think there were uh, about six different um, locations. And from there, they came to communities like ours. And there were no formal refugee resettlement uh, agencies set up. So religious organizations um, uh, stepped up to the plate and um, recruited volunteers to, to take these folks in. And uh, most uh, organizations uh, found volunteers to take them into their homes. And so you'll find folks around town who um, in invited folks to, to live with them for a while. 500 came to Hampton Roads. Um, which had more military bases, so people had more relationships with Vietnamese people that they had worked with, and uh, 300 came to Richmond, and that's with no formal support system. Um, the 1975 uh, refugee uh, experience was a typical um, uh, folks are not usually airlifted from uh, the, the site of warfare, um, but um, they still need to be rescued in many, in many instances. So the, the terms are um, we use to, to disguise people who are escaping um, um, warfare and persecution are refugees, asylum speak seekers, and internally displaced persons. Um, most people who are escaping uh, violence go to the go to safer parts of their own country, and they are called internally displaced, and they are they number in the millions. Um, the international definition of a refugee um, specifies that they are outside of their home country, except in the United States does make an exception and when they resettled the Amerasians, who were the children of American service members who were discriminated against in Vietnam and persecuted religious minorities in Russia. An asylee is somebody who arrives to another country and at the border asks for protection. The US is currently granting special immigrant visas to people who served as interpreters to um, the US forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, um, you know, it just makes sense that pay, uh, refugees are going to across the border to their neighboring countries for safety. Uh, most recently, this has happened in um, uh, Eritrea. It's been in the news and of course in uh, Central America. Um, but the, the countries of first asylum are very often struggling to support their own citizens. So the camps are supported by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, and, um, but these very large numbers can destabilize the host country, especially if fighting crosses the border. Um, uh, Non-governmental organizations interview uh, these newcomers, set up files on them and ascertain if they might qualify for third country resettlement. The UN High Commission is there to um, vet all these refugees as well. Uh, less than 1% of refugees are offered third country resettlement. And so these pictures down here are in Pakistan and in Nepal. These are um, Bhutanese refugees, but camp situations look this, pretty much the same the world over. Um, very under-resourced under and folks are very exposed. 
Uh, the U.S. responded very generously to refugees who arrived, arrived from Southeast Asia from 1975 to 1980. Uh, but the floodgates really opened in 1980 uh, when there was an outpouring of Vietnamese boat people and Cambodians were able to escape the Khmer Rouge, which also had a horrific genocide. Uh, also at the same time arriving to US shores were uh, Cubans who were helped by Castro, about 125,000 Marielitos came and uh, Cubans fleeing the um, repression of Papa Doc Duvalier. So Congress got together and formalized the US refugee resettlement program. It had bipartisan backing from 1980 until this most recent administration. It has welcomed refugees from countries across the globe and it involves many agencies uh, to ensure security service coordination and successful program integration. Uh, people often raise the issue, how do we know who these people are? Um, are we exposing ourselves? And no, no citizen and no other immigrant is, is more carefully vetted than a refugee. And this is just a quick snapshot of the number of uh, national agencies that are involved. Um, the domestic partners involved in refugee resettlement are the resettlement agencies, the Social Security Administration, uh, the local departments of social services and the state department, the health departments, schools, employers, volunteers, who are the backbone of the program, faith communities, the cooperative extension services, and many, many more. Uh, these are the refugee resettlement service providers in Richmond. Uh, the two agencies currently working with the Department of State uh, to bring folks in from overseas and ensure that their basic needs are met are the International Rescue Committee and Church uh, Commonwealth Catholic Charities. Uh, they are working with folks who have been granted uh, refugee status, uh, special immigrant visas, and uh, folks who have been granted asylum. Uh, I used to work for Refugee and Immigration Services of the Catholic Diocese of Richmond. Church World Service was a consistent uh, provider of um, refugee resettlement services until uh, the recent um, funding cuts. And I would expect them to be coming back. And Church World Service used to work out of the Virginia Council of Churches. Uh, highest worked uh, Hebrew Government Aid Society works the Jewish Family Services, and Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services also was uh, working in town in the 80s. Uh, folks who are uh, working with folks without <laughs> um, refugee status, but who come uh, with um, the needs of refugees and the experience of refugees are the Sacred Heart Center. And Reestablished Richmond works with all these organizations uh, to um, help meet the needs of these newcomers in our community. So you can see this is a, a very detailed chart, but this gives you an idea of the ups and downs in numbers through the years that we start in 1975. You can see the, uh, the it's color coded um, and uh, this brownish red is Asia. And, um, and I guess it was a little former Soviet Union, but ups and downs, uh, 100 and looks like 140,000 came in uh, 75. 1980, the year the Refugee Act was signed was over 200,000, but up and down, up and down. In recent years, it was closer to 70,000. Um, and um, as you are well aware, it went down significantly under the Trump administration. Who's been resettled here? In, uh, 
Uh, the first five years, it was primarily uh, Vietnamese with some Lao and Cambodian families. In the 1980s, um, as I mentioned, a lot of Vietnamese and Cambodians. We were part of a special Cambodian guided placement program where we find cluster communities of size. Um, and uh, folks really stepped up and we had a huge cadre of volunteers. Also uh, um, working with the Haitians and Cubans, Poles, Iranians, Soviet Jews and Pentecostals. So uh, 231, 700 came in 1980 and then it was kind of settled down to 70,000 in 1985. In the 1990s, we had Bosnians and other uh, populations from the former Soviet Union, uh, continued with Southeast Asians. That's when the Amerasians were allowed in, continued with Cubans and um, began to see more from Africa. In the 2000s, uh, continued to see folks from the former Soviet Union, including Meshkedian Turks uh, and uh, from Africa, Liberian, Sudanese, Somalis, uh, and began to see Afghanis, Iranians, some North Koreans, Vietnamese, and Cubans. Um, 2010 to 2016, um, the Bhutanese were probably the, the largest population, and the Burmese, and folks from, from Burundi, Congo, as well as uh, Iraq, and a few Syrians um, and Somalis. And in the past year, it's been Afghani SIVs and Congolese refugees that are our biggest populations. So last year, we had 11,800 folks coming to the USA, only 60% of the very, very low 18,000 ceiling that was set by the Trump administration. But what did that mean for Richmond and what did that mean for Virginia? Um, we still saw some, some good numbers because 75% of those who came to our, our area were special immigrant visa recipients um, from Afghanistan. Only 62 refugees were, were brought to Richmond by the two resettlement agencies. So um, we look forward to seeing our numbers go up through the Biden administration. We're, um, we're very pleased that um, those folks who were uh, targeted for um, persecution because of their affiliation with the United States were able to, to get out of uh, Afghanistan. So, so what's key in refugee resettlement is um, volunteerism. And um, we know that many of you on this uh, Zoom are already volunteering, but we try to put it out there. There's many ways to volunteer and the agencies that are sponsoring this event would love to hear from you. Uh, also to advocate, uh, our federal representatives need to know that we do care. So please be in touch with them and get involved with the, in elections. Make sure you know what their policies and priorities are. Um, if you are a um, world traveler and have more frequent flyer miles than you need, there's a Miles for Migrant program that uh, would uh, love to have uh, your miles to help folks who are at the border and need help getting together with their relatives in, in the country. Uh, raising awareness is critical. Um, we can share book lists if you would like to start a book club for um, yourselves or your family members. Um, money is, of course, essential. Um, the needs are huge overseas and locally. So um, when you're looking for folks to, get, to make donations to, please think of our populations. And then there are um, 
the cost of education. So please uh, uh, be in touch with your local schools to ask if they have scholarship programs that you can contribute to. So um, the IRC has a great poster that says refugees bring more than a bag of their belongings, which features Albert Einstein. But there's many others who um, amongst us or lived amongst us who are refugees. And uh, here's a short list with some photos. Um, and of course, Superman was a refugee. Um, so I'd like to share some comments that we used to hear from uh, our volunteers that uh, what do you call it? would give us uh, energy to move forward uh, sometimes when they say that, you know, I've learned more from them than I was able, ever able to teach the family. I came to appreciate uh, their culture and question what we do here when we have spare time. Uh, it was intergenerational. Uh, all of our family got involved and everybody uh, loved their experience. Um, one memorable uh, um, comment was uh, that uh, when a, a well-to-do woman took a family to reapply for food stamps, she, uh, her eyes were open that she never knew how hard it was to negotiate our public assistance uh, system and how to, how to make ends meet, even when you are working full time and uh, doing everything like you're supposed to. Um, so, and then uh, becoming more attuned to foreign policy issues and um, how our policies and, our invo and in international involvement affects real people who have the same concerns that we do. Uh, so I can't, I can't uh, emphasize enough how, uh, how valuable it is for folks to be involved in refugee resettlement. So I'm open to questions and um, comments. or stories, <laughs> if folks have anything to share about their involvement with refugees in Richmond. Is anyone on the call already volunteering with Reestablish Richmond? Do you care to share sort of your experience working with us so far? Well, before the pandemic, I uh, was offering transportation uh, I didn't do it very many times, but I, I really found it meaningful and also somewhat awkward. Um, so I, I, think, I think that I have a lot to learn. I'm willing to learn, but I also, well, part of it was a language barrier. And, um, but, but I was glad to be able to do that. I think that's probably a very normal experience. You know, it's it's hard to connect when you don't share the same language with someone. But um, I think there are other ways that we can connect, and I I think that it, it is a learning process. And I, I think maybe other people have had that experience as well. Um, does anyone else want to share sort of how it's been for them? Can I say a word or two? Thanks. Hi, um, my name's Bill Allman. Um, I'm, I'm currently with um, the Sacred Heart Center. Uh, prior to, to me joining the, the staff, I was a volunteer there teaching ESL uh, for, for several years. Uh, this isn't a plug for, <laughs> for Sacred Heart, but I do want to uh, encourage potential volunteers to, to be involved. Um, you will learn so much more and, and receive so much more from them than you are imparting uh, to, to them. Um, it's, it's, it's a, um, 
it's an experience that is it is quite meaningful. Um, there's a lot of things out in Richmond for us to do. Um, I, I, it's my belief that helping helping these folks who are just need to find their way around, um, they're not asking for charity. They just want to help, you know, just <laughs> somebody to give them a clue. Um, and I, 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 I believe that. By doing that, you're, you're making so much more. You're making, you're improving their lives um, to to a great degree. So, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, I'm Wayne Swatlusky. Hi, Marilyn. Nice to uh, see you again. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I was a volunteer with Sacred Heart uh, Center also um until the uh until the pandemic and even then i did some with the food bank and i just really thoroughly loved it i've decided i'm i i will return once uh i feel a little bit more uh protected after my second uh vaccine uh because i'm a little older um but is there something i'm not that familiar with um reestablished richmond and Wondered if there were opportunities during this time to volunteer virtually with uh, with you or with any other organizations. Kate, you want to respond? Sure, um, Wayne. Thanks for asking that question. Absolutely. I know that um, all three organizations, Reestablish Richmond, the International Rescue Committee, and you know, Sacred Heart Center has a few as well, have virtual opportunities. Um, our, our, I'll let um, someone from IRC speak for what their virtual opportunities look like right now, but our opportunities right now mostly look like online English tutoring where you match one-on-one, um, some mentorship. We have some folks helping people study for their citizenship exam, those kinds of things that can be done online. Um, we do have a few opportunities where for our programs, like someone said that they were driving for one of our programs. Um, instead of driving a person, you could drive materials to a person's home and drop them off so that they could more effectively engage in our online programming. But um, uh -huh. do you all have, you wanna to speak to your opportunities? Um, I'm Sharon. I'm from the International Rescue Committee. We also have uh, <clears throat> limited volunteer opportunities uh, that are remote only um, and that will continue for as long as we need to. Uh, also, English language tutor matching one-on-one -on -one with a client um, over Zoom or WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, whatever app you and the client are both using that you find easy to use. Um, also family mentorship, um, just sort of being a cultural ambassador. We know both being a mentor and uh, ESL tutor, when it's not in person, there are new challenges. So we are constantly looking for um, new resources um, to help you connect with that family uh, because that, that in person of you know, being able to hand things to each other, help them go through their mail and explain what's, what's there is a little more challenging. So uh, we, the opportunities are there and we know that um, the progress that you make and, and the, um, that, that in-person connectivity is missing, but, but we're working on that. Um, we also have uh, health mentors uh, just helping people who have a lot of medical appointments and are seeing a lot of doctors understand navigating the U.S. healthcare system uh, when they arrive. Obviously, that can be overwhelming for people who were born here, um, much less not speak the language and are totally new to the country. Um, so that would be a partnership with our health liaison and uh, the clients that that, that department serves. Um, and then we also have our career advancement program uh, where we will be connecting volunteers to help people uh, work on their resume, maybe convert it from a CV to a resume format that US employers would recognize, help them practice job interview questions, understand what looking for a job and interviewing for a job might be like in the United States. So those are the remote opportunities we, we have right now. Okay. 
Wow, that's great. Good. Okay. My only problem is is uh, <laughs> the only language I speak and understand is English. So unfortunately, I'm kind of uh, I'm limited there. Uh, but those are great opportunities. Well, um, uh, we have no prerequisites for ESL tutors. You don't have to speak a foreign language. Um, all of our clients are looking to learn survival English. Uh, what do they need to know to go to the bank, to the grocery store? And um, we can definitely, and I know Reestablish can as well, and Sacred Heart as well, have resources to share with volunteers that would, would help you um, overcome some of those very initial barriers of someone just starting to learn English. Oh, hmm, that's interesting. Oh, that's great. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll jump in just for a second, just to let you know that I don't speak a speck of Spanish. Um, <laughs> I, I just don't. I just don't. And I've been teaching. Uh, in fact, I've been teaching the basic level. It, it can be done. When I was teaching ESL at the Sacred uh, at uh, Second Baptist. Um, which is another great program. Um, you'd walk into language classes where there would be eight students in five different languages. So, oh. so you, uh, it, it's immersion and it's what they want you to do when you take formal training in ESL. Um, so don't, be, and, and I know where you're coming from. When I started, I, I, I must have asked four times, like, are you guys sure? <laughs> and, um, and and we are um, so and and so so um, okay. Be, well, that's be, be encouraged. Good, thank you, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. This is Viv Lee's, and I just want to add to that because um, I've been teaching ESL as a volunteer for mm, close to fifteen years now. But uh, the last three to four years, I've lost track. I've been uh, doing it with IRC, and I had always taught people who were at second or third level. And I know no other languages either. I'm trying to learn Spanish now, but most of them don't speak Spanish. I've only had one Spanish speak speaker since we've been with IRC. They've come from Afghanistan, Vietnam, um, lots of other places. But uh, I was scared to death at first thinking I couldn't do that. But it's amazing what you can do with pictures and charades and uh, magazines and videos and translators. Um, there's always a way to do it and it, and it becomes quite humorous and, and a lot of fun. But most of, the, <laughs> most of the students I've taught with IRC have been going into uh, working with young women in, in their homes with their children. They didn't have transportation to come to the office. Uh, they had small children. I've taught many days with a child on my lab and a translator in one hand and pictures in another. <laughs> Uh, but it's just been the most fabulous experience. I just recommend it to anybody to try it out and see what you think, because you meet the most wonderful, interesting people and learn so much. And going in the home and sitting with a family is just that much more. You can't avoid being a little bit of a mentor too, because you get so many questions and you're able to, to work with the person with the very things they're working on. And it might be trying to get a driver's license or um, you know, something special unique to them or trying to handle kids homework or, or things like that. But you'd be amazed what you can do even though you speak no other languages. It's been a real experience and education for me. Highly oh. recommend it. <laughs> oh, that's great. Where, where would some where would someone like me begin to to learn um, the English as a second language uh, curriculum, or just be trained in it? Well, I'll let the experts talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. I'll post in the chat a link to where you can sign up to find out more information for okay. Establish Richmond. I think Marilyn, there was a question in the chat or whoever um, about how geographic placement of SIVs and refugees is determined. It's pretty complicated. <laughs> um, uh, I, I know more about refugees than SIVs. Uh, dossiers are brought to a, a round table in New York where all the refugee resettlement agencies sit and they're trying to make sure that refugees are sent to different communities across the country so that they're um, 
so the network is well utilized, but they also try to um, do family reunification. And so um, it's always a challenge to, to meet these competing interests. But uh, refugees are asked, you know, who's with them in the refugee camp, or who do they know in the United States? And so they, um, so they'll stay in the community that they're uh, resettled in because a lot of money goes into setting up a house, and leases are signed, and then if somebody moves, it gets to be um, painful. So. Um, so that's how they come. So SIVs are more self-directed. They buy their own plane tickets and um, they often come to where they have relatives or where they've heard rumors that it's a good place to come. So um, sometimes communication has not been good because they're not resettled sometimes through resettlement agencies. And um, uh, so I think that's why Richmond has gotten such a good, uh, Good sized SIV population is because interpreters knew one another and talked about Richmond being a um, nice community to come to. Anybody want to embellish your listening? Right now, the infrastructure is uh, sorely gutted. Um, when they took the numbers down from uh, 70,000 a year, or it was gonna be even higher, I think, uh, um, in, when Ob in Obama's last couple of years, uh, down to the 30s and then the teens, um, of course, there weren't enough uh, refugees being resettled to maintain the offices in the communities where they had been doing work. And in Richmond, we lost one resettlement agency because of that. Marilyn, I'm wondering if your um, long history and, and experience, you mentioned that so, sort of early, before there were refugee resettlement agencies, families were welcoming refugees into their home. And President Biden has um, directed the State Department to come up with a new family sponsorship model mm -hmm. um, that, would, that would be implemented federally um, it's a success in Canada. Do you have any insight into what might what it might look like here in this new age? Well, rather than uh, families, I think it's often congregations that come together to take it on. And um, uh, what the resettlement agencies receive from the federal go government in terms of funding is only enough for maybe two months rent, uh, if you're lucky. Uh, it, was, um, it was enough for the, the deposits and maybe you know, a couple months rent, but it was, it was ve it's very skimpy funding. All the furniture is donated. It was, it, every, every, every household set up was a, a minor miracle because imagine if you had to get everything new. So you had to, you know, thinking about uh, silverware, um, uh, cookware, bedding, linens, uh, and the trash cans. Oh, and they also had standards that you had to meet. How many trash cans per household? And <laughs> they got into the minutia of what was required, but the, the funding didn't go up as the, as the, the detail came uh, with it. And then uh, filling the refrigerator. So, um, so there's certainly room, it never would have happened without donations and it never would have happened without volunteers. Um, if, if you have to do it totally on the backs of paid staff, that, that meant you had to say, here you go, bang, you're done. Uh, you couldn't be there to read the mail with them, to take them to the store uh, and introduce them to all the complexities of life. So. Great to have that bilingual, bicultural staff uh, working with the new arrival. It, there, there just never was enough federal funding to, to, to do a good job. So um, folks you know, had to depend on the, the community at large, which was good for the refugee. It gave them much more support. It got them uh, uh, more 
connected to, to Richmond uh, because it had real people and not the staff as the intermediaries of uh, their integration. So, and it's good for us because if you talk to Richmond, you know, and say you're involved in refugees, they'll say, oh yeah, we did that. You know, I, I, I would say probably 75% of re Richmonders who have, uh, are, are over age 60 will tell you that they've done it. <laughs> They've been connected to refugee resettlement. And it always was bipartisan. So how it became uh, um, so divisive is beyond me. Does anyone Hopefully. else have any questions or anything they'd like to share or ask uh, Marilyn before we wrap up? Thank you, and I hope folks will get involved and, and talk it up with your friends. Uh, this COVID thing won't last <laughs> too much. Hopefully it won't last too much longer. Or maybe as the weather gets warmer, you can do outside things that uh, will connect. And you know, there is the possibility of also doing um, things with, with the families or with the kids and the families are struggling with school. So um, every, every level in the, in the refugee family um, needs help in their integration and they very much value that American connection. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Marilyn, that was great. Thank you. Um, Kate, do we have the link to get involved, shared in a place that they can um, access it after the meeting? Yep, um, we, I'm, I'm, it's in the chat, but then also um, as we follow up with uh, materials from the week, um, I'm sure each, each agency will provide a link as to how to get involved. Look for it in your email box. And part of the resources we'll share out at the end of the week will include the chat from each session. Um, so if anything else, check for it there. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks a lot, y'all. That was really good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Take care. Be safe. Thank you, Marilyn. You too.